Hello and welcome to The Print. I'm Vandana Menon, and today we're joined by Suhag Shukla, co-founder and executive director of the Hindu American Foundation. The HAF is at the forefront of conversations that the diaspora is having on Hindutva and Hinduphobia. It might sound dissonant to talk about Hinduphobia in the United States, where the Indian diaspora have been so successful, but the HAF believes that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. So how do you define Hinduphobia? So, and has, and so has it gained acceptance as a concept both since the HAF was founded in 2003 and after 2014? So we've actually adopted a definition, a working definition that was pulled together by scholars who have been uh, looking at this issue from a variety of vantages, whether it's religious studies, whether it's ethnography, whether it's sociology or psychology. And um, so it's a long definition, but it's a working definition that essentially is looking at what is the intent behind a statement or movement, whatever that might be, or an action, and what is the impact. And so in adopting this um, definition, which is available on understandinghinduphobia.org, it provides us a tool to articulate uh, what the problem is, but also helps us identify what the problem is. So where does Hinduphobia occur? I think that at its very foundation, you're right, that the Indian American and Hindu American communities have succeeded in the United States, largely speaking. I also don't want to though then trigger the model minority, which that in and of itself has its issues. But when we look at the way in which Hinduism or even India to date are looked through. They still are a colonial lens. They're a lens through which Indian contributions are diminished, um, the tradition is otherized or reduced or um, made to look different. And those are the ways in which Hindu phobia we see at just the very root level of narratives. Then it's iterations. A narrative is so critical to how policies are formed, how people are treated in society, and that's how we see Hindu phobia emerging. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of narratives, it's also been called a political ploy or a smokescreen for um, Hindu nationalism. And you obviously think otherwise. Can you tell us? About Absolutely. I mean, I oftentimes chuckle at this idea of Hindu Americans being Hindu nationalists. We live in the United States. We make up less than 2% of the population there. Um, there are legitimate concerns as an ethnic and religious minority that we face, whether it's the way in which um, Hinduism is taught in public school textbooks or the way that um, we might be able to utilize immigration policies um, that are fair uh, and allow people to flourish. Um, country caps, for instance, inadvertently impact um, the Indian community disproportionately because of country caps. Mm -hmm. These are all legitimate concerns that we're facing. Uh, are all of them Hinduphobic? Absolutely not, but many of them are. For us to be able to have agency in the way that we're presented, in the way that we're understood, is no different than any other ethnic community in the United States. We don't see those same accusations being foisted against other communities in the way that they're foisted against us simply because we're Hindu, which in and of itself is then Hinduphobic. Mm. I want to circle back to the currency that the term has gained. Have you seen it being used in um, mainstream language? And how is it different from racism and what the dot busters that was happening in Jersey in the 70s and 80s? Sure. I think Hinduphobia is, it occurs in far more subtler forms um, than there are aspects of racism in Hindu phobic uh, mm. actions or in incidents of Hindu phobia, but it can also be very subtle. Um, it can also be difficult to uh, detect. Um, I'll give you an example. A few years ago, someone, there was a Hindu gentleman who ran a cow sanctuary. He was inspired by Hindu concepts of ahimsa and um, reverence of the cow. And for that reason, he started a cow sanctuary. Some neighboring kids uh, left a severed cow head on the driveway. Now, the local law enforcement didn't necessarily understand the Hindu aspects of a cow sanctuary and leaving a severed cow head there and how that might 
potentially have um, Hinduphobic motivations. So because you take uh, people who are uninformed or ignorant or unfamiliar with our culture and traditions or whatever understanding they have are rooted in what they learned about India and Hinduism in sixth grade, it's hard to recognize. Mm. After all, we're such a small community in, in the country coming from a culture that is not well known. And so for that reason, it can kind of go under the radar. Another example is that very often Hindu phobia is fomented by other people of Indian origin. And it's a political disagreement that they might have, but they engage in Hindu phobic rhetoric, such as denying uh, genocide of Hindus in 1971 in Bengal. That's just a egregious example. And you refer to this as horizontal hostility. Exactly. And that makes it all the more difficult to fight because when you're so few in, in the country, you're confusing essentially people who might be potential allies because they're looking at the person you're accusing of fomenting Hindu phobia and they're saying, well, but they seem to be Hindu too. Mm. Um, so that makes it challenging. But in terms of the, the word Hindu phobia and whether it's gained currency, I think more and more people are utilizing it, but just like Indians, we have a hard time agreeing on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who want to say, well, it's not really a phobia, it's something else. It's hatred. We should call it Hindu hate, um, which I think is an equally strong word and it's appropriate in some contexts. Then others might suggest other terminology. So there's still that debate. Um, but interestingly enough, um, even with the word anti-Semitism in, in the context of the Jewish community, there hasn't always been agreement on that term too. Some people in the Jewish community feel that the word anti-Jewish hate would be a more appropriate term because not everyone knows what Semitic means. Mm -hmm. So these are going to be ongoing debates. I think it's really important to um, have this working definition that at least those who feel that Hindu phobia is a good word to describe some of the incidents that we're seeing, that we can galvanize around it. I mean, I ask this because the idea of Islamophobia, and um, it's been used to criticize sometimes legitimate mm -hmm. um, criticisms of Islam. Are, aren't you kind of walking down the same path? I think you could. And that's why I think in the definition, you will see that you can distinguish two elements there, both intent and impact. Now, impact is a lot easier to see. Have you delegitimized someone's concerns? Have you desecrated um, a temple? Or um, you know, have you engaged in some sort of discrimination against a community on the basis of their religion? So impact can be uh, visceral, um, it can be visible. Uh, but intent, I think, is the key here. That if something has happened as a result of ignorance, um, I think it would be difficult to call it Hindu phobia. Mm -hmm. And so a working definition in that sense gives us a way in which we can make the distinction so that we're not crying wolf, so to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. We're not calling everything Hindu phobia. And you know, at the Hindu American Foundation, we're always getting emails, you know, at least a couple a week. I saw this, this is Hindu phobia, you need to do something about it. And inevitably, when you have a conversation, say it's um, some sort of commercial product that has a Hindu deity on it. Um, if it's a t-shirt, you know, there's context that also comes into place. Um, but if it's a, a, a toilet seat, because that has happened, um, it takes a conversation with the prediction company or with the manufacturer to say, listen, the context in which you're using this deity is deeply offensive, and therefore people are seeing this as Hindu phobic. But very often it might be a context where the person who's perpetuated it didn't understand or didn't know. They didn't do it intentionally. That's an opportunity to educate, and that's why I think it's important not to just loosely use the term, which I think has happened with Islamophobia. Right. Has there ever been a moment where, the, where you at the foundation have not been able to agree if a certain act was Hindu phobic or if a certain, yeah. It, that's a, that's a really good question. Look, we have a really diverse team 
And there are times where, you know, an email will come in or an inquiry will come in that this is Hindu phobia and we look at it and we might have differences of opinion. And at that point is when we decide to exercise due diligence. Let's find out why this company or this individual has acted in this way. What was their motivation? I think having a conversation is really the first step to mm-hmm. then base a decision on whether action is merited. Mm-hmm. Um, because something that the HAF does talk about is the introduction of caste as a category at mm-hmm. American level policy, whether at universities or at the council level. And you've also said that introducing it as a category doesn't protect against discrimination, it increases discrimination. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a bit about why that is? Sure. Um, So the foundation of American law, and especially the concept of equal protection, is that all the laws have to protect everyone equally. That means that you cannot create categories, especially non-discrimination categories, that are going to single out and target any one community. So what are these non-discrimination categories? We have categories like national origin, race, gender, age, any, if you look at any one of these categories, they are what is called facially neutral. When we talk about race, it's not talking about everyone except white Caucasians. They're saying anyone, if you are discriminated on the basis of race, if you're a white individual working at a company that's run by mostly Hispanics or African Americans, and you have been uh, made to work in a hostile environment um, or harassed, you would have a cause of action. It's not presuming that one particular race is always the victimizer and another is the victim. The key difference in the addition of caste is that caste is something that is singularly associated with Indians, uh, specifically Hindus, but more broadly South Asians. And the fact of the matter is, you you brought up horizontal hostility, that these are other Indians who have pushed and lobbied for these policies. You've also described it as scoring a self goal. Exactly, they have, they, what they do not realize is that now they've actually institutionalized policies that they will also um, be um, harmed by. Because now you've asked for essentially ethnic profiling of South Asians broadly. What's the long-term impact? If I'm a college, for instance, and I have a choice between admitting someone who is South Asian versus someone who's not, and now I have a special policy on the books that has already put in the implicit bias that somehow South Asians are so inherently bigoted that they merit a special policy a diversion from well-established legal principles of facially neutral policies to one that's facially discriminatory, they carry a special liability. Why would I want to bring on to my campus someone who is inherently bigoted? Even if they're not, the implicit bias is now set because there's a special policy that only applies to them. When we look at the motivations behind these policies, I don't think most of the administrators who are not of Indian origin really know what they've done. They've tried to do this kind of out of a concern like, oh, this is a problem. And they're kind of walking into this predominant stereotyped, inaccurate representation of Indian society. But more importantly, there haven't been complaints. There hasn't been any indication that existing policy, which already covers things like ancestry, have failed to provide protection if someone indeed has been discriminated on the basis of caste. You talk about liberal college campuses as potential sites for Hindu phobia. Do you think it's because these like liberal campuses would be more critical of the concept of Hindu phobia? I think that a lot of the criticism of Hindu phobia or this idea that Hindus are using uh, Hindu phobia as a cover are coming from Uh, Indian origin academics, many of them, or their allies. And their primary uh, point of contention is politics in India, Mm. and perhaps a perception of losing ground here. And it's 
that's where Hindu Americans become easy targets on college campuses. If um, and and similarly and interestingly enough, Jewish students are facing the same thing. You can oftentimes literally take an article that's highlighting anti-Semitism or some of the challenges Jewish students face on campuses and replace Jewish with Hindu, replace Israel with India, mm -hmm. and the story would make complete sense. I mean, how do, how do you situate yourself in the rising, or how does HAF situate itself in the rising communalism and communal tensions in India as well as the caste of conversations around caste that's right. happening in India? It's, it's very, we have an American context, and I think that that's really important to keep a distinct line. Um, certainly immigration and the migration of people is a, is a constant when you have free and open societies. So mm -hmm. people are coming from India to America, probably fewer people from America are, are coming to India, but the realities are very different. Um, to be a Hindu in, and a person of Indian origin in America is very different from what it's like to be a Hindu in India, and then even going to a more macular level, being a Hindu in Gujarat versus Andhra Pradesh versus Kashmir, they're all very different realities. And I think it's very important for policymakers, for members of the media to understand the nuances, the context of each of these different realities um, to better increase the understanding of different situations so that we can address problems when they arise. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a person who is a minority in one country, just because they might be a majority in another, doesn't mean that somehow the benefits of being a majority in one place transfer over mm -hmm. to another context. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important to understand. And that's what you refer to as vertical hostility as opposed to horizontal exactly. hostility when it's coming in sort of in an external framework. Exactly. So for instance, domestically, um, we have movements in the United States where a Christian version of history is trying to be, uh, their efforts to push um, like biblical studies and things like that into the secular curriculum. Um, that's where Hindu Americans have been able to partner with um, progressive Christians, Jewish community, Buddhist community, even um, atheists and humanists to say, look, our public schools should teach about religion, but they should not be teaching religion. And that's a subtle difference. Um, that sort of issue um, are the important issues that get obscured when someone tries to say, well, they're using Hindu phobia as mm -hmm. a cover because there are legitimate issues that um, Hindu Americans face. Right. Does the HAF align with the RSS's views? No. I mean, I, well, let me, let me rephrase that. It depends on what the issues are, right? There might be issues where we align. There might be issues where we vehemently disagree. Can you give me an example? I would, you'd have to give me an example to, for me to be able to answer. Um, where do you see, where are the spaces where Hindu phobia does not exist globally and in the States? Sure. I think that there are many spaces where Hindu phobia doesn't exist. Uh, on a very day-to-day um, -day level, I think there's great interest in Hinduism and Hindu practices. We've seen the tremendous growth of yoga. We've seen more and more people turning to things like Ayurveda, to meditation, to even broader concepts such as reincarnation, um, religious pluralism, all of these things. So on the whole, on a day-to-day -day basis, you can meet people who are deeply um, curious about Hinduism or have engaged themselves in Hindu practices and have been personally transformed. Uh, and so at that level, there is actually a profound respect for those people who have at least learned about Hinduism directly through a practice or through a friend. Uh, and those are the spaces where there's great opportunity for increased conversation to improve the understanding of our traditions. Got it. Well, thank you so much for joining us here at The Pint. Um, I'm Vandana Menon. Um, thank you for watching.